Good morning and welcome to our webinar on garden retail in the age of COVID. We have the pleasure of hearing from international retail consultant John Stanley who joins us today from Australia. So it's actually 9 p.m. for him right now. You may be familiar with John's name as his columns have appeared all over the world including in Greenhouse Canada. Now, garden retail has been deemed essential in some provinces of Canada. They're in a bit of a gray area for some others. John's going to look at some options for retail that will satisfy COVID distancing measures, helping you move product and reach new and existing customers. Also joining us today is Kathy Bartolik, who is Executive Director of Ontario Farm Fresh Marketing Association, and she's going to join in on the Q&A after the presentation. So for those of you who have questions, send them to us as we go along using the questions box in the panel to your right. We'll address as many of them as we can during the Q&A. And if your connection cuts out, don't worry because a recording of this webinar will be made available online and a direct link will be sent to everyone who registered in about 24 hours time. So without further ado, I'll hand the controls over to John. Hello there. This is what's often called a red coffee session, I'm told. Red, the red wine, because it's past nine o'clock at night in my part of the world. Uh, for most of you, it's early morning, it's your coffee time. So it's red coffee. Uh, we thought most of the people involved with this were going to be from Ontario. We have people involved from British Columbia all the way through to Newfoundland. We've got people from California, Michigan, Ohio, Alabama, Massachusetts, Germany, and South Africa. So this is a fairly international session that we're going to look at. And I hope in the next uh, 45 minutes, we can give you some ideas and give you some challenges, give you some things to think about on how our industry has changed so rapidly. And uh, I was in Canada literally, I think, eight weeks ago in Ontario. It's amazing how the world has changed so quickly. And how has the world changed? Well, the children around the world are doing rainbows. They're painting rainbows as a means of giving hope and encouragement to all of us. But um, the way we're looking at the industry does change around the world. This is a picture of a rainbow. It's a rainbow from a wholesale nursery in Scotland in the UK. Uh, this girl made a decision to plant a rainbow of colors using live plants before those plants were dumped. In the UK, they probably had the worst scenario because the government decided they were not an essential service. I hope that that will change this week. There's been quite a lobbying going on. And I realize that if you go around Canada, the US, around Europe, et cetera, uh, the view on what is essential services varies with each government. And I think it's important that we get the message across that we are an essential service and that we need to involve everybody in that journey. And that's one of the issues I want to look at in this session. So in the UK, millions of garden plants set to be binned. It's caused a major um, political upheaval on the pros and antis as far as it's concerned. And uh, we'll look at some of the positive stuff that we can uh, do as we move forward. For those of you that are listening from the USA, you are very familiar with the Victory Garden campaign. And the Victory Garden campaign was one of the most successful campaigns during the Second World War. And the Victory Gardens have come together again and brought some material forward, which is now free to all of us. So one thing I want to mention is that I've had a look at it myself. The Victory Garden uh, material can be downloaded for free and be used by any nurseries, growers, greenhouses, or garden centers around the world. So if you haven't been on their webpage, go onto their webpage, have a look at what's available, and uh, download some of that material. It's uh, there to be used by any of us to help us on this journey. 
So fresh ideas. We're going to look at 11 ideas uh, today that we can think about and implement in our own businesses. So we'll look at those 11 ideas and take them step by step and explore the opportunities. The first one I call curbside appeal. Now, those of you that know me know that I'm uh, fairly adamant as a consultant to say we must get the curb appeal right in our businesses, that it must be engaging, it must be attractive. I still think curbside appeal is a huge issue for our industry and something we've got to get right. Except in the last few weeks, curbside appeal has changed. McDonald's have curbside appeal. Uh, Tim Hortons has curbside appeal. Kentucky Fried Chicken have curbside appeal. We've got to start looking at these types of businesses and create curbside appeal for our own businesses, except now it has to be contactless curbside appeal. So many customers are now saying, I will come to the garden center, I'll come as far as the parking lot, but don't ask me to get out of the car. I want you to load my vehicle for me. So one of the issues that's become a huge issue has been curbside appeal pickups. And some of you, I believe, are in the farm market industry. I am seeing some amazing increases in turnover in, in Ontario, the UK, and around the world with curbside appeal in that sector. And I think as garden centers, we need to look at the opportunities for curbside appeal. No contact plant pickup was launched on the 27th of March in the US. This, I believe, was financed by a non-horticultural organization to work with garden centers. So what we're seeing is the uh, big end of town seeing the opportunity for no contact plant pickup and want to work with the garden center industry. And I believe Monrovia Nursery in California have just put something together today on working with garden centers on a plant pickup service. So we've got to think about that plant pickup service and should we be introducing it into our garden centers? I think our consumers are going to demand a contact, no contact pickup service from us. Another program I've just come across was smartplanthome.com, which is doing the curbside cart. And that plant finder is working with garden centers in the US to establish these curb appeal pickup points. So one thing we're gonna see a lot more of is how we present ourselves to the consumer with a drive-through option. And there's a number of garden centers around the world now looking at drive-through, express drive-through, drive-through avenues. Something we can have a think about is the drive-through option. My personal view is Drive-through will not go away. I think the garden centers of the future will have a drive-through option and continue to have a drive-through option. So I think this is gonna be a trend the consumer is gonna demand from us is more and more drive-through options within our businesses. They're used to it in the fast food industry. They're getting used to it in the farm market industry. I think they're gonna start demanding it in our own industry in when they're picking up garden plants. So drive-through is something that we need to be thinking about. Number two in my trends is something again that has been with us for a long time, and that is grab and go. Grab and go for the millennials has been a huge market. Grab and go in the food industry has been a huge market. And you go into most supermarkets, most food stores, there is a grab and go offer. Now is the time for grab and go to come more strongly into the garden center. We've played around with grab and go, but we haven't taken it seriously. 
Now our consumer wants to grab and go. So if you're going to get the garden consumer walking around your center, now is the time to start establishing grab and go offers. But the message I want to give with grab and go is the cost of labor to build a grab and go product. And a grab and go product is where you're adding value to the product to provide a finished product. Don't do cheap grab and goes. The labor input for a cheap grab and go is roughly the same as the labor input for a more expensive grab and go. So I think we should look at higher priced items for our grab and go offers and developing those. So this is a um, garden center in Sweden that was doing azalea grab and goes. Love the concept, it works for them, but I much prefer looking at this grab and go in Denmark where they've used buckets, put a group of plants together and provided a higher ticket item. So grab and go, we should be putting them together, putting them in a logical area for the customer to see, but make sure they're high price items. The Czech industry has done this exceptionally well for a number of years. And one of my clients is Kladek, and they do exceptionally good job of grab and go in their flower department and in their indoor plant department. So think about the grab and go options, but don't do cheap grab and goes because the labor is going to be the same. Go for the more expensive grab and goes. This is an opportunity to develop in your organization. So that's my number two. Number three is probably one of the um, controversial ones, home delivery. And consumers are wanting to put an order in from home online, and they want you to deliver that product. So home delivery is becoming more and more demanding by the consumer. So again, let's go back to Denmark. Um, Peter Vang, the owner of Plantarama, he has 11 garden centers around Denmark. Last week, he bought 11 trucks and he rented another 11 trucks. So every garden center in his group now has two home delivery vehicles. So consumers in Denmark can order the plant and have it delivered to their door. So he has taken home delivery very seriously and is trying to make it work for the consumer. Now, some of you know that we are, in fact, sweet chestnut farmers, Linda and myself, and we do home delivery. Uh, I've done more home delivery this year than last year. Our challenge is we've got a three-hour drive through a police checkpoint because we're locked off in our part of the world, so we have to prove to the police that we're legitimate in our home delivery. And the lucky part we've got is we can create a milk run. And I think if you're going to do home delivery, now is an opportunity because you can create a milk run. You can get a Google app so you can put all the contacts that you've got in the app and do a logical milk run. We are now achieving about six drops an hour once we get to the marketplace of Perth. The benchmark in the industry for home delivery is three an hour. I don't think at three an hour we can justify a home delivery system. We've got it up to six. Uh, it's, it's a tiring, it's a cumbersome affair, but the consumer is demanding it. Uh, it's a means we've used to keep our business alive. And I know some businesses out there have been saying to me, don't mention home delivery to me again. It's too much of a hassle. But home delivery is part of the, the mix that we should be looking at. Uh, because our consumer is demanding uh, that they that we deliver the product to their door. So my number three is home delivery. Number four, make and take has become take and make. I've been a great believer that we should do make and take um, events in our garden centers. It's been a great way of engaging the consumer, and it's been a great way of adding value 
to our loyal customers and increasing the average sale per customer. A make and take is where you make something in the garden centre and you take it home. So make and take has been huge over the last few months. But now we've got to reverse it. It's now take and make. So make and take becomes take and make. Now before I look at take and make, let's just look at make and take. One, one industry that's found make and take hugely successful is the food industry. And culinary schools have been booming. And as a supplier to the industry, we've been supplying products to culinary schools where groups of people in one location have made meals and then they take them away. So we've seen this huge growth up until now in culinary schools. And we've seen the same in the garden center industry. Let's take you back to Czech. This is a make and take workshop in Czech where the consumers came in, decorated their Christmas baubles, and then were buying all their Christmas tape decorations in a make and take workshop. So the engagement has been the critical issue. But now the engagement has become more challenging because we're not engaging to the same degree with the consumer. But I still think take and make works. In our own business, every week now, we do a Cooking with Chestnuts workshop where I or Linda cook different methods with chestnuts. We do it on a Sunday and we release it on a Sunday night through Facebook. Uh, we are getting through our database a huge amount of hits on the cooking school where we do the cooking on screen so they can do the cooking of the chestnuts in their homes. So now we've got to create our own TV station through YouTube or Facebook. We've got to start editing our own videos, sending them out on a regular basis to the consumer. So one of the important issues now is that we are becoming the um, video makers of the take and make. We recommend what people should get from our organization. And in our cooking classes, we recommend what chestnuts, chestnut flour, etc., they need. Then we go through the workshop, and hopefully we wait for the orders to come through. So it's beginning to work for us as a business, and it's working in the gardening industry. Colonial gardens in the U.S. are doing a very successful colonial kids club because the children are at home. Uh, they're looking for activities. Gardening is one of the most brilliant activities children can do, especially at this time. So now Colonial Gardens have created the Kids Club where they're producing a video and then the kids are getting the, taking the kit from the business, making them at home, putting ideas on Facebook, etc. So that take and make concept is working for Colonial Gardens with their kids club. But at the same time, look at other ideas. It could be designing elegant, elegant edible gardens. It could be how to grow herbs in containers. The whole host of take and make workshops that we need to get into. Because we now need to engage the consumer, but we need to engage the consumer in their home. So we've had this huge shift from engaging the consumer in the garden center to engaging the same consumer, but this time in their home. And I love all the innovation that's coming through at present. And there's lots of innovation starting out there. This is one that started this week in my own neighborhood called Neighborhood Events. Because we're all in lockdown and we're Australian, we still got to drink red wine. Now, the government actually told us we could only buy one bottle at a time. Didn't go down very well because our wine consumption has gone up by 86% in the last three weeks. So, neighborhood events is a promotion that's been set up by vineyards. Not one vineyard, but there's a present about six vineyards. They are putting virtual drinking sessions together. 
So the six vineyards are putting boxes together of wine from all their vineyards. They're then sending tasting notes to their databases and also doing a video. So back to take and make, they're doing the video in their vineyards of the wines. So they're doing wine schools. But the interesting thing with neighborhood events is they're not doing it on their own, they're doing it in a network situation. And I think something we've got to start looking at is how do we network with other organizations who may do what we do or may be linked to what we do in creating events that consumers can do at home while they're locked up in their homes. So neighborhood events is something that's just started in the last week in my part of the world. Number five, we've got to start selling success kits. I think we were weak at selling success kits before the virus came along. And I now think we've got this huge opportunity to sell success kits. We know that the millennials and a lot of consumers want success but are scared about getting involved with plants in case they fail. We also know that we've got all the products on the shelf, let's call it in the garden care department, to let them and encourage them to be successful. But in most of our garden centers, <coughs> we have to, or we, we let them search out those products. I think it's time that we put success kits together of the allied products that should be available when people are planting a tree, when people are buying an indoor plant, when people are buying outdoor plants. We should be saying, to be successful, this is the success kit you need, where we've taken it off the garden care shelf, put it into a group, called it a success kit, and use it as a means of providing confidence to the consumer and adding value to the average sale. Now, success kits, again, it's not new. They've been around for some time, but we've never taken it to the level that we should be taking it to. So we should be taking success kits to the next level. So, for example, Garden on a Roll has been a success kit coming out of the UK, and I came across this uh, about seven years ago, where they were providing these plans and groups of plants and showing people how to splice plants on garden on a roll. There's tomato success kits, where you can get the whole kit to grow the tomato. There are herb success kits, herbal plant garden success kits. We know success kits work. Garden in a box was another idea. I think we need to be a lot more aggressive in providing success kits for these consumers that we know want to get into the plants but are scared about failure. And if we can provide the success kit, we're taking a step in the right direction. So that's my next idea, is success kits. Number six, customer health and well-being. Now, if we go back, a month, the big issue was climate change. I don't think about climate change at present. I don't think it's about climate change. At present, it is about the consumer, the person, and their health and well-being. So again, we've seen the shift from the big pressure about climate change to now personal well-being. And we need to look at the customer's health and well-being. And this is where plants especially are essential in the marketplace. And this is what frustrates me in the UK, where the government said plants weren't essential for health and well being. That says, as an industry, we haven't been strong enough in getting the message across in how strong the well being of the consumer is. One of our clients is an Australian client, Plant Life Balance. It's um, partly government finance and partly financed by the independent industry. And the aim of plant life balance is to say to the consumer, you need plants for health and well-being. It's an app. So we have an app on our phones. 
you can take a picture of your living room, your bedroom, your bathroom, your outdoor garden. Then the app will show plants that are suitable for that environment that are available from your local garden centre. That's now being developed to the next stage, and hopefully within the next few weeks, I'll be able to report back to you the way plant life balance is being used to even increase even more the well-being situation in the industry. Earlier this year, I went to Wisley Gardens, the Royal Horticultural Society show, um, and Wisley in February had lines of people queuing and lining up to go around their glass house. This was February. They were lining up to see plant rooms. And the Royal Horticultural Society had set up different rooms like the best bathroom plants. So they put a bathroom together and put the plants suitable to the bathroom. They put the bedroom and plants suitable for the bedroom. This was the Royal Horticultural Society, not a garden centre, and people were lining up in February and making notes on what were the best plants for a bedroom, what were the best plants for a kitchen, and so it went on. It shows the opportunities we've got in that well-being sector if we think about the plant in a different way and think about how the consumer is thinking and how we can set things up differently from a consumer's perspective. Some of you will be aware of PlantSnap. Uh, I'm a member of PlantSnap. Uh, I've got it on my phone. The objective of PlantSnap is you, you can take a photograph of a plant and it will name that plant for you. So the consumer doesn't have to rely on a plant's person in a garden center. They can rely, if you like, on Mr. Google, who tends to have more authority these days than thus in our plant knowledge. And PlantSnap is one of these plant identifications. But PlantSnap, last week, sent me an email. On that email, it was reasons to spend more time with plants. Plants make you happy. Plants relieve stress. Plants improve memory, creativity. Plants connect you to nature. Plants are great family activity. They clean the air. Plants help people recover from illness. Plants just make you happy. And I think, yeah, from plant stuff, that was a great promotion to get us into plants. And we need to think about those promotions and how can we relate what we've got more strongly to the well-being industry. And there are resources out there that can help us. One of the best resources I've come across recently is the book from the Royal Horticultural Society, Your Well-Being Garden. How to make your garden good for you, the science, design, and practice. I think every garden center around the world should be using this book for ideas so they can communicate those ideas to the consumer. Uh, it is a great book. It's only been out about six weeks. Um, I'm sure you can get it through uh, Amazon or straight from the RHS. It's a great tool to help us with the well-being garden, which is what the consumer is looking for, is well-being, and uh, how can they make gardens good for them? So some resources out there that can help us. Number seven, personalized shopping. Again, nothing new. This is a sign, a shopping sign I came across many years ago in Baltimore in a shopping center. And uh, it was personalized shopping. Uh, when I'm doing some work in some countries, I know garden centers that do personalized shopping. I have a client in the farm retail industry in the UK who four weeks ago had a traditional farm market. Now, two days a week, between 10 o'clock and two o'clock, they do personalized shopping for their consumers, their customers, their, their high ticket customers. It is working exceptionally well for them. So some people want home delivery, some people want drive-through, 
I think some people are now going to say, can I have a personal shopping experience? So I, would, I wouldn't be um, afraid of promoting personal shopping experiences with a plant guru as part of the package. So as things change, personal shopping is something I'd seriously be looking at as a tactic moving forward. And floral fidi. Number eight is my floral fidi. Now I know some garden centers in the US and Canada have played around with floral fidi in the past. Now is the time, I think, to reintroduce floral fidi. Floral fidi has already been introduced again in the UK in the last two weeks. So though the UK industry has had a lot of drama and a lot of negative publicity, one thing they've done is they've reinvented Floral Friday. And the aim of the, the promotion is that Floral Friday, on a Friday, anybody that wears a floral shirt pays $1 or one pound into a children's charity. And uh, it's great to see this being done and us connecting with the community. And I think Floral Friday is an opportunity for us to connect with charities and especially children's charities. The UK has done a brilliant job through Greenfingers Charity. And the Greenfingers Charity has been set up by independent garden centers to collect money for less able children in the UK. And it's great to see, even though they've got all the dramas going on, that uh, Greenfingers Charity is still collecting money for children through Floral Friday. Why don't we start Floral Friday as a connection with our marketplace with designated charities? Well, we've got to number nine. Garden packs, not products. And I think we've got to start thinking about selling packs rather than selling products. So number nine is garden packs, not products. Now again, I went through, in preparing this, I went through one of the uh, Royal Horticultural Society's catalogues. They have a garden centre. Uh, and in that garden centre, you can buy border favourites. You can buy the scented garden. We can buy plants for pollinators, foliage and form. We can start selling packages to a far higher degree than we've done in the past. And in the past, we've always sold products. We've been tending to be product focused. Our consumer is experience focused. They're looking at their garden, they're looking at their borders, and they're saying, how should that border look? So I think garden packs, not products, is something we need to start thinking about and promoting the packages rather than the products in getting our message across to the consumer. And number 10, we need to promote our growers. And our growers are critically important, and I believe half the people listening to this webinar are growers. The growers are the heroes we need to promote. Consumers are wanting to buy local. Research came out of Australia today saying that Australians, compared to four weeks ago, are 65% more inclined to buy local product. This is happening around the world. People are now looking for local. So if they go into a garden center, they want to buy local products from local growers. Now, I know we could argue for the rest of the evening what local is, because it varies from state to state, province to province, country to country. But we need to promote local, and we need to promote our growers. How would I be doing that? I would be getting a picture of the growers up there saying, these guys are the specialists. So this is W&S Lockyer's from West Sussex in the UK. The consumer knows they established their nursery in 1988. They know it's a family-run nursery. They know they're specialists in auriculars, snowdrops, marines, and succulents. Knowing that, they wouldn't buy discounted auriculars. They would be buying the best 
auricular at the best price. So we need to provide premium products, but to create the premium product, one of the tools we need to work with is the growers being made as heroes and promoting them within our businesses. So we need to be looking at promoting our growers as a strategy within our businesses and uh, getting the pictures up of those growers and getting them across as heroes as well as ourselves in the marketplace. And finally, my number 11 is be positive with your customers. These are difficult times. And uh, when I go into the city, I realize how people are stressed compared to those of us that live in the country. Uh, city people are pretty stressed at present. We need to be pretty positive and be positive with our consumers. So think about the language that you're using. I think the language is important. I would be using words like looking forward to. Give them something to look forward to. Tell them you are looking forward to. We should be using positive language and positive language like we're looking forward to the end of the lockdown. We're looking forward to the summer, etc. Use words like looking forward to. Don't use negatives like what I found the other day. Don't use closed due to virus. We've decided to be closed. Thank you. For sale by odor. There's going to be lots of businesses like this. We should not be in that market sector. We should be in the positive sector. Consumers are coming to us for their essential services. They're coming to us because they want to enhance their gardens and it's for their well being. So we need to be positive. So part of the challenges for us is it's more about the place uh, than the plant. It's even more about their why, not what they're planting, but what they're trying to accomplish. The experience is now in their garden and in their home. It used to be in the garden center. And let's hope eventually it'll come back to us creating experiences in garden centers. But at present, we've got to accept that the experience we've got to help them create is in their home, which means we need to think differently, at least in the short term and possibly in the long term, about how we put the package together for the consumer, which means our businesses are changing rapidly and will continue to change rapidly. So there's my 11 short-term strategies for us to think about. It's a new world that we've entered. It's a world that we've all had to get used to and learn new skills and uh, learn them quickly. And I did a, a radio program uh, last week and it was for farmers. And the interviewer said, what is the biggest thing that you've learned? And I said, not to get embarrassed making mistakes because in a changing world where I've got to change so rapidly, I am making mistakes and so is everybody else. As we move forward, as we learn new skills so rapidly, we've got to accept that mistakes will be made because it's moving so rapidly for us. What does the future hold? Who knows? But I think we're gonna get small, smaller retails, smaller boutique stores, I think we're going to see small local businesses come back into the marketplace. I think the local garden center is going to be something that's going to be promoted in the future. I think the future is about retail and services being combined. So what we're having to learn about home delivery, milk runs, curb appeal, and services, that'll be part of the retail mix. We may even have services in our organization that aren't actually focused on the garden sector. We're going to be more ethical in our retailing. Local retailers, I think, are going to collaborate. We can't do it on our own. We're going to have to network with other local retailers. Consumers will shop digitally. That is probably the biggest change we've seen in the last few weeks, is that consumers now will shop digitally. 
and they expect to carry on shopping digitally. And they're going to be sourcing products more locally. So those are some, some of the things that we're seeing. Um, I was working with garden centers in Sweden the other week, and I made the mistake of taking money. And it is a digital economy in Sweden. They do not use money. I went into my local farm supply company the other day, and he said, while the virus scare is on, we are not taking money, we'll only take credit cards. And he actually said to me, you know, in a few weeks, we'll go back to taking money. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the future is a completely different market. We're all going to have to change in that market. None of us know what that market is going to look like, but there's plenty of entrepreneurs out there. There's plenty of ideas taking place out there. And uh, we need to look to the future and look at how we can develop our own businesses. Uh, I'm doing a daily Facebook page, uh, John Stanley's Gathering. Uh, as many of you know, I work, do a lot of work in the States and uh, Canada. Uh, I'm not allowed to come to your part of the world probably for the rest of this year, but hopefully I'll get back into. Uh, the States and Canada and come and see you guys and I hope you have a great season it'll be a different season I hope you think outside the box and we should thank Greenhouse Canada to putting a session together where there's so many countries um, listening to ideas and developing ideas on one platform so I hope the 11 ideas have given you some thinking and uh, you may even think of some more to develop your business. Stay safe, and let's hope that all garden centers will be looked on as essential services and will be able to develop their businesses in the coming weeks. So over to you guys for questions, and Kathy, you're, ask, you're answering the technical ones. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, so maybe let's start with a logistics question. So we were talking about curbside appeal and delivery. John, what key tips would you have for garden centers looking to start these new services and even for perhaps ornamental growers who are looking to start selling direct? Um, the challenge is putting it together. Uh, I'm doing, it's a farm market survey. I'm doing through a survey uh, that's coming out Friday. I haven't got all the results yet because the farm industry has got to, has been forced to go into curbside um, appeal and there's no benchmarking. So I'm hoping to get some benchmarking and I'll send that over to you on Friday. Um, it's just, this is going to sound silly. It's the size of the, the parking lot. Um, some, bit, the most successful have done parking lanes um, where they can get curb appeal in a number of lanes. Now, the average one that I'm coming up along is if you've got enough lanes, you can service the vehicle within 10 minutes. I know companies that are not doing it that well and it's taking 25 minutes. The problem is getting the right products in the right location to make it work. Because if you think of an existing garden center or wholesale nursery, we've got plants all over the place and products all over the place. We've really got to start saying, what are the essential products we need in the curb offer, promote those and put them close to the offer. It's not easy. Um, and I'm not saying we're gonna, you know, it's a test situation. Uh, and of course, the stocking, people you need more people to stock it as well so where the garden center was relatively uh, let's say easy to serve a customer now there's a lot more pressure because the customer doesn't want to spend much time in the loading process so if you've got a small parking lot it's a lot more difficult than if you've got a large parking lot but it means um i've got clients in in the farm market industry where they've converted probably half of their farm market retail into a holding area for products. So we've got to develop holding areas, not display areas. Mm -hmm. But I'll send you the figures when I get them Friday. 
Awesome. Um, and Kathy, for you, uh, how are your members approaching this new reality in terms of curbside pickup, delivery, and, and new ways of getting their product to their customers? Yeah, we've had, uh, I'm really proud of our members. They are changing as fast as they can to address these issues. Uh, the first thing they had to look at was to go online somehow to have their products uh, visible and available to their customers in, a, in some kind of an online format, which could be as easy as just a list on their Facebook page or uh, as complicated as getting a online store set up in a couple of days. And a lot of them have done that. Um, some of them um, are still open to the public. Uh, they have to limit the number of people that are coming into their markets. But a lot of them are going to online ordering and curbside pickup. Uh, and one of the things, the sort of uh, surprising things that are coming out is the amount of extra labor uh, that's involved in pulling those orders together for people and having them ready for uh, the customers as they arrive. Um, uh, it, it wasn't something they had thought about originally that it would take as much time as it is just uh, pulling all those products and getting it ready. So mm -hmm. that's a big change right now. Mm. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I have heard that uh, with curbside pickup that there have been recounts of some long lineups of cars <laughs> waiting for their product. Mm. Um, is there any way around that other than, you know, maybe they might not have access to a larger parking lot space? Well, there's, and again, I'll find out when I get the report in. Um, what I'm seeing is most businesses 25% of orders are coming online, so you know what's coming along. 75% they're coming in and asking for it. Our job is to get them to order the product online so we can get it together before they get to the garden center or the farm market. Um, but at present, a lot of people are just um, driving up to the gate and saying, I want A, B, C, D. We've got to encourage them to put their order together before they get to the garden center, nursery or farmer's market. That gives us a bit of space um, to put an order together. Because Kathy's right, it's uh, putting the order together, the time consuming situation that's the issue. Gotcha. And one, then, one of the, oh, sorry, sorry. Greta. go for it. <laughs> one of the other, other things uh, we've seen with some of our members is that they're limiting their offerings. So they're just looking at their best sellers, especially if they're just starting to get open. They haven't been open uh, through the month of March, perhaps, and they're just starting to get open. Uh, they want to limit what they have available. They're looking at what their best sellers have been in the past and just kind of start with those products. So don't have, you know, 100 products available. Start with maybe 20 or even 10 products that you would have available to the consumer. Uh. Got it. Um, and John, there was a part of your presentation that talked about uh, personalized shopping. Could you expand a little yeah. bit on that? Yeah, um, I came across personalized shopping, as I said, in shopping centers where the, the consumer contacts, let's say the garden center, and says, I want to you know, build a border, build a garden, etc." They um, get escorted around the garden center by a knowledgeable person. And it's a personalized experience where the, um, uh, the, the plants person loads the trolley for them. And uh, it's a Rolls Royce service for the consumer. Uh, I've come across it in, um, in the eastern part of Europe, and it's working exceptionally well with the rich end of town. And I think we've got to remember that uh, even though we're seeing some tragic uh, unemployment figures coming through most of our countries, there's still some people with money, uh, and they should come to an independent garden centre or an independent farmer's market for the, the Rolls Royce service. We shouldn't be sending them to the box stores. And uh, we could promote that to a limited market. And it is a limited market, but they're high spenders who enjoy that personalization. That would be 
quite the package. I mean, you got yeah. someone shopping for you and then delivering it to you, hopefully. I, I yep. would love that, <laughs> especially during this time. One, yeah, I've got one client that does it when he's closed, which even gives him more status because he opens just for his personalized shoppers. Mm -hmm. And then they, I guess they can make use of their time while their the garden center is closed. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, for John and Kathy, are you seeing a lot of collaboration between local businesses? So for instance, um, maybe garden centers selling local produce, uh, local artisan products, in addition to their usual offerings and vice versa, perhaps other cheese producers packaging up baskets that include flowers. Uh, I'm going to say toilet paper. I'm the Australian. <laughs> we went around the world. We ran out of toilet paper. And I've got farm market clients selling toilet paper. So to answer your question, we're seeing diversification going on. So if I look at my small little town, I've got, I can go into the gift shop now and buy food boxes. Uh, we're seeing, I think we're seeing a lot of networking in communities where there is a mix of product. And uh, I never thought I would say that toilet paper works in a farmer's market, but it has, and uh, he sold a lot of toilet paper. So I've seen a lot of diversification taking place. And uh, I think that's one of the changes we're gonna see moving forward, is a lot more networking between small businesses, because we have to. And I think the local customer would, in the future would want us to. And Kathy? Yes, we have lots of examples. Uh, one of our members is uh, Murphy's uh, Farm Market and Bakery in Alliston, and uh, they've uh, gone online, obviously, for their products. Uh, but they've also are working with uh, another small bakery in their town who specializes in gluten-free uh, products, and they're um, selling uh, this other bakery's gluten-free products on their online shops. So they obviously don't have any gluten-free products, uh, so they've decided to carry the products from this other bakery. So that I thought that was really interesting uh, that they would be collaborating in that way. We also have um, a gift shop in town here. She uh, is actually focuses on uh, selling chalk paint and painting furniture, but she also brings in uh, various artisanal products that she sells in her little shop. And just uh, on Friday, she had um, an online sale. So she was in the shop showing everyone all the products that are still in the shop from all the various artisans and basically trying to sell these products online and then they would be available for delivery or as porch pickup and it turned out really well she did really well on friday as as did the other artisans that are involved in her business so that's another great idea oh that's great to hear okay so thinking about the future of it um, even before COVID, there were a lot of conversations about how we can make gardening more attractive to the new generation, uh -huh. to appeal to consumers who may not have taken care of a plant in their life or have been uh, too scared of killing their plants to try. How do you think this pandemic will change the perception of gardening and garden centers? Let's start with you, John. Um. I think we're going to see well-being be the driver that it should have been for the last few years. Uh, we, we know the research, we've got the research. Uh, we have, in my view, not used it aggressively enough to get a message across to the consumer. And I think the consumer is actually now leading the way. Um, we need to we need to own the conversation moving forward with the consumer on well-being. We have an opportunity to be well-being centers. And maybe the word garden center could be the wrong word in the future. It could be we're well-being centers, but we must own the conversation. And uh, that I think is the critical issue. It's gonna be well-being 
and own the conversation. And uh, I think we've got an opportunity if we're prepared to own the conversation. Uh, Kathy? I think in general, people are going back to the basics and they're just uh, looking for a simpler life. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in uh, growing your own food. So a lot of people are looking for uh, vegetable plants that they can uh, grow themselves and getting information on how to grow their own foods. Uh, the whole backyard chicken uh, experience is going to explode again, I think, uh, as people want to have their uh, own eggs. And there's just generally a lot more emphasis on local and people are searching out and wanting to support local, which is great news. Uh. Got it. Now, um, for someone who is looking to start putting garden packs together, um, what are some main steps you would suggest that they take? Uh, let's start with John. Uh, putting garden packs together, um, get to understand the customer base and where their need their needs are how big an area do they want to look at um how big an apartment do they have how big a garden do they have get to know your local market exceptionally well and provide a product that suits that market and it can be as Kathy said it's back to basics and we need to you know, get back to basics uh, understand the consumer and that consumer will vary completely between uh, British Columbia, Yukon, and uh, Newfoundland. There'll be a different consumer, different needs. And uh, we need to get to understand that local consumer, then put the package together. Gotcha. Um, and Kathy, do you have any suggestions as to how uh, people can best promote their new products to consumers? Say they haven't been online before, uh, they're just starting to get online, maybe through a simple Facebook group. Um, what are some ways that they can promote their new uh, services such as delivery or new products like garden packs? Uh, yeah, social media, definitely, for sure. Um, and not necessarily every platform. It just depends on your uh, capacity. So if you just want to pick one platform, if you just want to be on Facebook, just do the best job you can on Facebook. Have uh, consistent uh, messaging and show up uh, consistently so that you have a consistent uh, presence. And make sure that you uh, review and look at the comments that are coming from your customers. So that's the feedback that you're getting, I mean, that's the direction you need to go and you need to listen to your customers. So more than ever right now. So make sure that you're not just putting stuff out there, but you're trying to engage with your customers and trying to get feedback from them. And, and that'll give you a really good idea of what, what direction or what area needs to uh, have some more work done or uh, more promotion done on it. Gotcha. We had a question about if you have any specific tips on cutting down pickup time and loading times. Um, I know we talked about communicating with the customer about what specific time they should come by and they should order pre-order online. Um, do you maybe have a specific uh, tips on the time frame? So are there uh, specific maybe 15, 20 minute increments between customers, um, specifics like that? John? Um, I'm gonna say at this point, no, because it's so new to all of us, which mm -hmm. is one reason I did the survey. We're all, we're all asking the same questions. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, at this point, the answer is no, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something we all need to find out quickly because okay. there's got to be the right answer, but I don't know what that answer is at present. Mm -hmm. And Kathy? I think maybe just building a little bit on what John said earlier, if you have the space, uh, you could possibly set up like an assigned pickup area. So you would have one called A, B, or C. And if you could clearly communicate with your customer what 
which of those areas he needs to go to to pick up their product, that might speed things up a little bit. So um, th because they're going to, you're basically essentially picking up in three different spots. So if you've got the space uh, at, at your farm to do something like that, that might help a little bit. Okay. Well, we just have a minute left. So maybe let's take this minute to um, give our listeners some final thoughts. Um, John? Uh, final thoughts are look at what's happening around you. There's a lot of entrepreneurial changes going on daily. Um, and the challenge to all of us is finding the time to actually look and monitor the changes and pick up good ideas. Uh, there's a lot of positive changes going on around us and we need to look at those positive changes and adapt them where we think fit to our own environment. Uh, we are lucky that we're in the right um, industry. There's some industries out there that are doing a lot worse than us and uh, keep going. The future's okay. ours. Uh, Kathy? Yes, I, I agree. Things are moving very quickly uh, right now, um, but you need to start somewhere. Start and whatever that is, whatever that little step is to start and, and address the issues that are happening so that you're still able to sell to your uh, consumer. And uh, don't be afraid. I mean, no one has answers. This is something that none of us have, have dealt with in our lives. So uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be embarrassed, as John said. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. And don't be afraid to let your customers know that you goofed, you made a mistake, you're changing things every day to try and serve them better. So just take any little step you can to move forward. Great advice. Thank you, John and Kathy, for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, to our audience, if you have any follow-up questions, you can email us directly. And a recording of this presentation will be made available online and a direct link will be sent to everyone who registered today. So thank you again to our speakers. Uh, we hope you found that helpful. Bye for now.